Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us at today's IAA Fireside Chat. Uh, the IAA is the International Advertising Association, and it is an organization that is um, a group of uh, entities involved in marketing from around the world, everyone from brands to media to advertising agencies to uh, vendors to sort of really anyone involved in the advertising ecosystem. And the IAA is uh, about thinking about the ways in which uh, the marketing industry can get together to be more thoughtful about the future. So today, uh, IAA's fireside chat is with uh, Molly Fluitt. And I think Molly's going to pop up on the screen. There, There's Molly. There we go. And hi, um, hi Molly. So um, I'm Jeff Greenbaum, and I am the head of public policy for the IAA. Um, I wear various, various different hats in my life. I'm also the chairman of the Global Advertising Lawyers Alliance, as well as the managing partner of a law firm in New York, Frank McKernan, where I practice advertising law. So the purpose of this fireside chat series is that we're, we're talking with various folks working in the advertising ecosystem uh, about the importance of collaboration. Uh, see, so what IA believes is that collaboration among the stakeholders in the advertising ecosystem is absolutely critical because if you have better communication and information sharing, there's going to be smarter regulation. And when you have smarter regulation, that's going to be better for both consumers and that's going to be better for businesses as well. And, you know, we really believe that when you've got better collaboration and better information sharing, you know, you can create an ecosystem that really allows businesses to thrive and actually is optimal for protecting consumers as well. So that's kind of the philosophy of IA. And so what this what this Fireside Chat series is about is about talking with folks about, you know, sort of what are some of the key things that are sort of happening right now that people need to take into account? And then how do you best in, collaborate with them? And how do you talk about these issues? And how do the various stakeholders sort of interact with one another? So that's kind of the philosophy behind this. Behind this. And so um, the reason I asked Molly to join us in this Fireside Chat is that, you know, what came across my desk was this very, very interesting report called The Rise of Policy Communications in an Age of Political Disruption, Businesses Can't Afford to Ignore Government Policy. And I was like, whoa, this is exactly the issue that this Fireside Chat has been about. And so I thought, who better to talk to than Molly? So Molly is the vice president of Politico's Media Solutions, where she oversees the European advertising and strategic partnerships, partnerships teams. And Molly is actually in London right now, and I'm in New York. And so I think the first step is to, after that long and kind of disjointed introduction, I think I didn't have enough coffee this morning, is for Molly, maybe you could just talk a little bit about, sort of set the stage for us, sort of talk about sort of what, I mean, we know what Politico is, but maybe tell us a little bit what Politico is and what Politico's media solutions is and sort of set the stage for us, uh, for us to talk more about the report itself. Yeah, no problem. So happy to be here and uh, thank you uh, for having me. So uh, Politico is um, a digital first paper that really focuses on politics and policy. That is our power center. That is what we live and breathe. Uh, our reporters and our editors are obsessive um, about these subjects. And we really care a lot about what we know and what we're going to really find out for folks overall. We're really unique because we are a nonpartisan publication um, that covers uh, politics and policy in both an irreverent and fun way, but also in a very serious way, because this is incredibly important content for our audience, which is really the most powerful people in the world. So think policymakers, industry thought leaders, and even other media are reading us to really make sure that uh, to keep the pulse of what we're covering overall. And so it's a fantastic publication um, with a kind of a great value system. And uh, Media Solutions is interesting because uh, for Media Solutions, it really is the commercial and advertising arm of Politico overall. But what we do is we help brands navigate the most challenging political environment. And we're called Media Solutions because though we have advertising as part of our suite of products for clients, they also need sometimes a little bit more. So we're also talking to them about research and custom content, podcasts, and digital media in order to create a really cohesive campaign overall that allows them to get in front of this policymaker and political elite audience uh, overall. So that's a little bit about Politico and a little bit about media solutions. 
you know, it's funny. I think that if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, even, you know, there'd be a lot of publications that would say we're a nonpartisan publication. We're really coming at this from a, uh, without, without, without a point of view that's going to impact this sort of editorial coverage. You know, in this sort of fragmented world, which I know we're going to talk a lot more about, how do you how do publications do that? How do you how do you manage to really stay as someone who is seen as like we're really not, you know, we're not coming at this from a particular point of view. We're really just trying to tell you what we think is going on. Yeah, I mean, our role is really to give you know the view and the oversight of the different approaches that are coming out of an ideological argument, right? So, what is the different sides of that. Um, and one of the best things I ever heard was one of our playbook authors uh, was uh, talking to me and I asked them the same thing. You know, you write every single day for hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, how do you kind of stay nonpartisan? And he said, well, when I wake up in the morning, if I've made the right angry and the left angry, I know I've kind of gotten it right. Right. So if everyone is upset, then we're probably right down the line. And that's something that we're always thinking about uh, overall and really making sure that every side of a view is represented. Because if you're going to come to Politico, you need to feel that you're in a trusted environment. And that's something that we're always looking to achieve uh, every single day with these incredibly strong teams. And we have expertise on that, right? Our reporters are some of the best political and policy reporters in the world, which gives you a different insight and kind of environment in which you're working in and then also reporting from. Well, I mean, you know, you talk about political reporters. I mean, you really, I mean, Politico, I think, has really gotten a lot of its own attention recently, right? I mean, in terms of just breaking news. I mean, I think Politico was the one that broke the Roe versus Wade story, yes. right? I think, yeah. I mean, like, this is, this is like serious reporting on sort of the most important issues that are going on around the world. You know, not only was the, the SCOTUS decision uh, Politico, but also if you look at uh, the European Union, we've also broken Qatargate and really highlighted uh, the needs for transparency in government overall. And so our reporters are really the backbone of finding uh, this information and making sure that we're really holding uh, people's feet to the fire, no pun intended, during this fireside chat. Exactly. Thank you. That's excellent. So <laughs> let, let, let's talk a little bit. I want to get into this report, which was so yeah. interesting. But maybe you could talk a little bit about what led you to even create the report. Like what was what was happening either kind of in the world or what you saw brands as needed to be doing in order to say, hey, we need to create a report to really focus people on this issue of engagement. So it was really interesting. So I was working with my team broadly uh, in Europe, but also in the United States. And we were talking a lot about how it seemed that when we came to talk to a brand, there would be kind of two feelings that would happen. One was, oh, thank goodness you're here. We're not quite sure how to talk to this audience. We're excited to talk to you. And the other was, we don't need to talk to you. Uh, politics is scary. We don't want to engage at all. And so what we consistently had to talk to brands about was the need to engage with this audience, uh, really in terms of branding, thought leadership, CSR, issue advocacy. And it was a kind of constant drumbeat uh, overall. And so finally, my uh, team and I, we reviewed and we were talking to individuals who were in the report, um, like uh, Pullman, who's the former uh, CEO of Unilever. And we said we had been having similar conversations with them about the need to engage. And we decided to then put our resources towards writing the report um, and diving deeper, because though it's something that at Politico, we talk a lot about policy communications is a core part of our DNA, especially when we're working with brands from the media solutions perspective, we recognize that maybe is not everyone's every day. And so we thought this would help people kind of uh, engage and understand how to start talking to this audience and give them an entry point to have that conversation internally as well uh, with other teams across uh, their business. Well, I mean, it's not, a, I think part of the issue is it's, it's, for many brands, it's not really a comfortable space to live in, right? <laughs> I mean, you kind of want to sell mattresses to everybody and yeah. you don't really want people to think you're a blue mattress or a red mattress or you care about this issue or this issue. And, you know, but it seems like brands are being forced to get comfortable with it. I mean, I think you cite uh, Martin Sorrell. You have a quote from Martin Sorrell. It says something. I will, it says, the world is fragmenting, so businesses are going to be forced to engage in political issues. And look, exactly. clearly, right, 
the world is fra- I mean, politically it's incredibly fragmented we see you know at this moment you know crazy stuff happening on this side of the atlantic on that yeah. side of the atlantic you know uh, across the mediterranean i mean like there's just you know there's all kinds of crazy political stuff going on around the world but what what is what does he mean by businesses are being forced to engage in political issues or what do you what do, how do you interpret that in terms of what do you mean by uh, this need to, to engage it's kind of there's a few different areas there that in terms of being forced to engage uh the first is that the policy overall nest doesn't necessarily need to be partisan right policy is you're really digging deeper into understanding sustainability or technology and there's all different aspects to that that are not a binary based on party necessarily. And so as a brand, you really need to understand that policy world in order to be part of the conversation. The best way to be uh, get regulated in a way or to all of a sudden uh, recognize that you know, a green initiative has been changed is by not being part of the conversation at all. And so if you are choosing to kind of stay behind, you're then not able to actually get ahead of politics and policy overall. Uh, It can seem like a scary environment. However, there are so many areas where you're already engaged in policy in your day to day as a business. And you're, you know, you're so involved from areas in terms of, you know, even just mobility or technology or sustainability. Think about just the normal parts of your business. If you're not kind of engaging overall, then you're you're always going to be behind. So I think what also in terms of the fractious world that we're living in, brands have to have an opinion. And one of the reasons why is CEOs are forced to have an opinion more so than they've ever been really before. So uh, Edelman actually did a study and they found that CEOs had a much higher trust rating than most policymakers, which means that consumers or just the general public were looking to CEOs to hear what their perspective was on a political or a policy issue, which means that also policymakers are looking at business to say, what is your opinion on this? When it comes to policy in particular, especially uh, incredibly complicated policies, sometimes the industry actually has more experts internally than government does. So then government has to lean on industry to really understand the technicalities within uh, their industry. But then also that can happen where industry needs to lean on policymakers to understand how government works to unpack how their industry can move forward. So it becomes a real dual relationship there. So, you know, we're talking about this sort of notion of being forced to engage. You know, who who's the audience here? And you, you talked a little bit about that. But when you think of being forced to engage, you know, there's this expectation of, you know, consumers wanting to know where a company stands on an issue, or uh, so there's just sort of maybe that aspect of it. There's this notion of response, corporate responsibility. You see something happening, and you need to say something because you have an obligation as a, as a, as a, a part of the ecosystem that you know you, you have to speak out because it's the right thing to do. There's the sort of competitive aspect of it, right? We know that you know when consumers see that companies or brands have a heart or stand for something that drives brand value. I mean, IA issued a report not that long ago that showed that, you know, consumers' perceptions about how sustainable a company is really was an incredible driver of brand value, which you yeah. know, speaks to this notion of standing for something. And then there's the sort of the policy aspect, the sort of the, the, the sort of regulatory aspect of as well, which is like you've got companies are regulated, you know, governments can make laws that can make it more difficult for companies to operate or or can make laws that are you know, not good for consumers or yeah. good for business or good for moving industry or technology forward. So, you know, what, when you're thinking about engaging in policy communications, are you thinking about all of these different pieces of the puzzle? A hundred percent. So I always make the joke that my co- team is going to ask a brand 10 to 20 more questions then another publication is going to ask them about their brand or CSR or advocacy campaign. And the reason why is in order for us to really make sure that we're building a strong campaign and a strong narrative with them is because we need to understand the entire ecosystem that they're in, right? 
what is their government affairs or public affairs team doing on the ground? What is their marketing team doing? What is their communications team doing? What is their executive team talking about? Because in order to have a really strong policy communication strategy, if you're not really understanding the whole ecosystem, something inevitably is going to drop. And so in order for us to make sure that we're providing really great insight and also targeting the audience, which I'll talk about in a second really well, we need to kind of understand that full field. And in terms of the audience that we're really talking about is the core political audience, which is policymakers, anyone who is elected or who is in charge of making policy, which also can in, in mean you know civil servants or appointees that have uh, the ability to make change. We're talking about political elites. Those are individuals who are part of that ecosystem around a policymaker. A policymaker is not a singular person. They're not making a decision by themselves, right? Especially on a complex policy issue. They are looking at their entire world around them. They're going to be talking to their staff. They're gonna be talking to their peers. They're gonna be talking to uh, lobbyists or trade representatives. They're gonna be talking to media. They're gonna be talking to experts and they're gonna be talking to NGOs, think tanks and acad academia to really understand that full world. That world around that policymaker are political elites. They're the ones informing that policymaker and they're the ones who are reading Politico every single day to ensure that they also are uh, on the inside of what's going on day to day because they're going to be asked for their opinion and they're going to be sought out for that. And it's kind of part of their tools of needing um, to do their job. And then kind of the third area is opinion informers. And really that's other media, right? What is other media writing? How are they covering a topic? A lot of the times they're the ones reading Politico, but that's also the group that brands need to be getting in front of as well in terms of education. Um, and so when you think about kind of those three audiences, those are really core to the Politico audience. But in terms of policy communication, that's also really who you're trying to get in front of as well. If you're looking at a broader issue, you're also going to include um, local coverage and local influencers from that, depending on the policy and depending on what your objective is overall. Do you think, do you think that the, um, do you think that there are big risks in terms of brand perception of not speaking about issues? I mean, I want to talk about the risks of getting on those issues. But I, I also wonder what you sort of see as the, you know, where a company says, you know, I, I, I just do not want to be talking about these issues. I don't want to be out there. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. You know, what do you, what do you see the risks to, to brands when they don't engage? The risk is that then their position is not known, right? They then don't have a place in, in the conversation. Um, a really great example is with DNI, right? So a lot of brands wanna come out and have a, a flag on their website and say, we support diversity and inclusion. That's great. But actually the way to demonstrate that you are part of DNI and you are part of inclusion is supporting policies that support that. And that is through policy. And that is through internal policy at a corporate level and external policy at the kind of government level. That is one of the strongest ways to demonstrate what your corporate brand values are is through that. So if you are a brand that says, that's too risky for us, even though we support it, totally on board, but we're not going to say anything, then there people don't have that understanding that you are in that world of either support or engagement overall. Um, of course, I'm on the side of the argument of if you don't engage, there's actually much higher risk in the long run than there is if you choose to stay on the sidelines. And that is because if policymakers don't even know who you are and they are not aware of what you're trying to do, they're not gonna give you a call. They're not gonna invite you to the working group or to say, I didn't know that you really cared about, you know, water chemistry and how that impacts, you know, the makeup of saving water in the future. Okay, well, they probably need to know that you exist in that way. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, too many devices. So all makes sense, right? So then the question is, is, okay, how do you think through this in a time of this extreme fragmentation? Right. I mean, the 
you know, yes, you know, Sorrel's saying, look, the world is fragmented. You're going to be forced into it. There's no way out of it. No. On the other hand, you know, every topic you've mentioned so far, right? On the one end, you go, no one's against diversity. No one's against making the earth better. And then you're like, no, actually, they are. Right? <laughs> and so, and, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to support the flat earth people, but at the same time, like, how do you as a brand smartly navigate this, you know, both your sort of ethical and moral duty to be saying things that make sense and the sort of what's right for the business and how do you say these things and what your consumers expect of you, you know, in this time of fragmentation, like, how do you begin to navigate talking about these issues? One of the big things and this is going to make it seem even bigger, but it's actually one of the best ways to think about it is what is the full life cycle of what you're trying to talk about that and how that impacts your business, right? So a really great example is uh, Mars worked with us last year and they were really trying to highlight how they needed, we really need to change how um, groups use GPS technology uh, because for them, if you used a different type of technology, which is polygon technology, uh, it allows them to highlight where where they can farm in deforestation free areas, right? So making sure that they can actually find areas where they should be growing cocoa in a safe way. But that meant that there needs to be a bit of a policy change on deforestation. That's a complex issue. It's hard to explain in day to day. But one of the, but it could feel also a bit risky, you know, you're going to kind of enter this debate. But the reason why it was important in that debate is because they were talking about it through their entire life cycle, right? This is a really important part of our sustainability practice, and it impacts every part of our, you know, uh, cycle of from making something from source to end product. And that can feel risky because now you're, you're dissecting one part of that overall. But in reality, it's they're really trying to make a positive change that then her, her, helps the entire corporation. So when you're talking about risk and you're trying to manage risk, you actually have to think about how does this discussion impact our entire life cycle of our company? We can talk about DNI as well, but really think about those policy arenas, reducing plastic. If you actually really need to reduce pra plastic, what part of your ecosystem, your, you know, supply chain, does that impact and where does that go? And also, where is, is our policy that's helping or hurting you in that discussion? And so breaking down these complex issues makes the risk much more manageable from that perspective. And also, it should start feeling a little bit less uh, intimidating from there because you're taking something that seems really big. Oh, we need to talk about reducing plastic but you're now narrowing it down even further. Where are we reducing plastic? Why? And where are we being helped or hurt in this conversation? How are we going to talk about that? Do you think that there is a difference between, or a recommendation, I guess, between when you engage in issues as part of kind of the stuff that's in your corporate DNA or that's part of a larger plan versus the sort of speaking out on an individual issue, like on a kind of a one-off basis? Like is, did, is there is there a better and worse way to approach these issues? It just depends on what is occurring with your brand at that moment, right? And that's one of the things that Politico is going to break, help break down with you, the media solutions team, right? Is this a one-time discussion? A great you know example of that is in an M and A and acquisition discussion, right? Like this potentially is only happening once overall, and this is really important because it creates a ripple effect across a certain industrial industrial business community. Okay, we need to talk about that in a bit of a silo overall. Um, so that's one thing. Or is this part of a larger communication plan and public policy plan that means that you've got actually five or six different issues that you need to be talking about? Where are they in the legislative calendar? How are you engaging with that? And so that's something that the media solutions team really helps pull apart for a brand. Sometimes they come uh, and they'll say to me, we have, um, we're doing an M&A and we've got six policy issues and we're changing our brand name. We need, you know, one, two month conversation that, you know what, this is a, this particular audience, highly educated, incredibly busy, has a lot on their plate. That's too much 
in too short of a time. You have to, we now need to break this down and find a way for it to be consumable for the audience and to achieve those objectives for you. And also we need to really understand what is once and what is a long-term discussion. So one of the things that it, at least it feels like in the US fr from a brand perspective is that, you know, we've got a lot of examples now of brands that have engaged in policy issues in various ways, whether it's, you know, responding to legislative initiatives at a state level or, you know, dipping their toe intentionally or not into, you know, advertising to particular segments of the population or, you know, taking full on advertising to celebrate diversity or other issues and get you know, really experiencing a lot of backlash from other other audiences. And I guess I guess one question is, is, you know, when you choose the issues you're going to speak out about, how do you weigh the risks and benefits to the I, I, this is important to my business. I need to talk about this is the right thing to do. I need to be talking about it. I believe this is going to be good for the business. I need to talk about it versus like, I don't want to talk about the wrong thing and see my share value go down by whatever it was half or something like that. How do you, how do you, how do you sort of map that all out? And yeah. I mean, there's no silver bullet for that one, right? It is a constant discussion. And one of the things that we're always telling our brands is research research, research, research. Make sure that you are really clear on who your audience is and how they feel about an issue before having a campaign or a discussion or a press release that changes all of that. Be really clear about your core audience and your core values and leverage research to make sure that you're doing that. Because if, you're, if you really don't have a firm footing there, you're inevitably your communication is going to be fragmented, which only creates a bit of a pile on situation. I was speaking with a large uh, mobility tech company last week, and actually they were talking a little bit about that, that, you know, a core value for them was around DNI and uh, with a lot of the Supreme Court discussion, you know, decisions recently, that there was a bit of a mixed feeling from their customer base. And, you know, what, how do you handle this? And they're really clear about what their core values are. They're going to continue to support DNI initiatives. That's critical for them as a company. And but the one thing is, is they are now going to have to go into a round of education discussions with our that policymaker audience, maybe even a consumer audience, to make sure that they're framing it and people know why they're doing this. Um, why is this important to them? And not really wavering from that, but that's where the research comes in and that internal understanding and buy-in from all stakeholders internally before, you know, speaking externally uh, overall. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the, I guess one of the, I feel like one of the things that I've been hearing a lot, you know, reading the news, but also just in terms of my own work with clients is people wanting to take a step back, right? As much as they felt like it was, as much as they feel like these issues are important and there's, really important business reasons, ethical reasons to be engaging in these issues, speaking at these issues, how important representation is, all those kinds of things. You know, people feeling very, very nervous at this point because of the kinds of backlash uh, that they're seeing when companies do engage an issue. You know, do you feel like this sort of, and there was a very, I went to a very interesting panel actually at can about sort of, you know, this sort of notion of like, should you be afraid to engage or are the consequences worse if you don't? You know, yeah. what, what's your what, what what what's your feeling about that? I truly, like I said earlier, like the consequences of not engaging are incredibly high. Uh, kind of taking a step away from like the brand discussion and going a little bit more into the issue advocacy side of the true policy communication side of things. If you, as a brand, are truly not talking about the policy issues that are important to you and how they impact you either as a brand or the industry with which you're working in, then you're missing the ability to affect change. So, you know, a lot of brands also say to me, well, next year is an election year. We don't need to be talking about anything, right? No one cares about policy during an election year, except for every single person who's running for every office from the UK to the EU to the US, Mexico City to Indonesia that actually need to impact policy from the second day that they get into office. So, when you're not talking about policy and you're not highlighting where these positions are, 
you are already going to be starting on a back foot when a new uh, Congress comes in, when a new commission comes in, when, you know, Westminster has a completely new uh, MP group. And that's because you miss the opportunity to educate them and to really build your brand awareness during that most critical time. And like I said, policy isn't always simple. Sometimes it can be, sure, but not always, right? We can talk about the Mars example. We can talk a little bit about, you know, we work closely with a few large agricultural companies. It can be very difficult to really understand the back end part of, you know, uh, agricultural regulation. But if as soon as you choose to not engage, as soon as you choose to say, someone else has got it, or don't worry, um, it's really easy to understand. You're going to get an entire group of MPs, MEPs, or congressmen who actually have never had any background in that. They're now in charge of creating that policy or legislating that regulation, and you're having to go through an entire education brand campaign months after when you should have actually been talking to them. So for me, the risk is high. This doesn't mean that you always need to come out and have mass branding or say, we're the best CSR company in the world, but you have to be really specific about what you're trying to say. What is it that you really need to get across? Uh, if you talk to the public affairs world right now, not only have they have already planned for 2024, they're already looking to 2025 because if, they're, if your industry is quote unquote ahead already, you've kind of set up the next four or five years for your business. If your industry is already quote unquote behind, you've got a much longer road. And so it's a really, it's really managing that risk. And also how much of an investment do you want to have if you choose not to engage now? Because you're going to have to have to choose to engage later. Um, last time I heard there's still a cost of living crisis out there. So isn't it better to have, you know, a more mitigated approach versus having to do a much bigger uh, kind of, a, you know, campaign at one point uh, and not to be caught off guard? So let's talk about we've kind of talked about the why i think yeah let's talk about the how so what are you know you've made a decision as a company these are the issues that are important to us these are the issues that are uh critical for our business these are the issues that are going to drive brand value you know wh what sort of the best ways then for a company to engage on these issues yeah so like i said the first thing is i hope you've done a lot of research or you've done research with us and <laughs> we really understand where uh, you are in terms of perception of this particular audience. The next thing is narrowing down in terms of your audiences overall, because uh, a policymaker audience is going to consume content uh, very differently than a political elite audience, even a media audience. So we really need to start breaking that down. Uh, what we find in a lot of ways is that you need to have uh, a diversity of platforms. Uh, and think about it this way. So uh, you're incredibly busy. Uh, you're being called into the commission. You need to, you know, get to your office. You're running into work that day. At that point, you're most likely you have time to read a newsletter or a podcast. So for a brand, you need to then be that first thing that they're reading in the morning. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to hang out, you know, uh, on the website all day, kind of reading that information. And so now you need to kind of think about where they are in the middle of the day, where they are at the end of the day, and how are you matching those consumption behaviors? At Politico, we kind of have a pretty good understanding on all of these different audiences where that is. So think through, thinking through podcast engagement or newsletter engagement, events are highly popular. It's a great way uh, to have that engagement. Uh, James Thurber, who is a professor at American University, who is actually in our report, mentioned how powerful events are because it's outside of the lobby. You don't necessarily need a lobbying pass, which is something you need in the EU. Uh, in DC, it's a great way for engagement. It's one way to not only uh, learn about a topic, but to engage with that target audience overall. And then storytelling. Storytelling is really important. Uh, when you have shortened amount of time, a big, beautiful ad campaign is great, but that doesn't mean it necessarily makes impact. You really need to make sure that you're telling this audience something new, something that they can use in their day to day. Remember, political information for this group is a tool that they do use to use their jobs. So your campaign should be telling them something new or giving them information that they thought, wow, that's going to make me look a lot smarter in my next meeting because this is critical. So 
leveraging uh, custom content, working with uh, our brand content studio is highly effective because we're going to break down those complicated issues and find ways to tell that story so it makes sense to this audience. So the how really comes down to a multitude of formats based on consumption behaviors, thinking about also when it is in the legislative cycle that your conversation is happening, and then planning that out. So also making sure you've got enough time. I love it when a brand comes to me and says, there is the most important vote for my industry next week. Can I please um, have a homepage takeover? I said, they've already made the decision about that vote. You've missed it, right? If you were going to engage on that, you should have started engaging on that about a year ago. And that timeline changes based on the city that you're in, DC, Sacramento, West uh, London, or Brussels. But the the week before, you you probably already lost the plot. So I mean, it's interesting. So you're you're saying how the 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 sort of political communications are engaging in these issues. It, it's less about being reactive, and and you should be planning those in the same way you'd be planning any other brand campaign, and really thinking about. Them. Yeah. think about the future. Exactly. You have to think about the longevity, right? Thinking through how how much does this particular audience understand and know about your issue before you start talking about it? You might need to start all the way from square one. They may have no understanding about fiber optic cables and how they need to be regulated. Well, that means maybe you need to start potentially months earlier. Maybe they already have a pretty, they maybe have a good understanding, but then maybe that's now you're talking less education and you're, it's much more of a call to action campaign. So really understanding and working closely uh, with brands like Politico or your public affairs teams to clearly understand that timeline. Um, that doesn't mean though that policymakers don't love overnight to make a decision and all of a sudden there's a vote very quickly. At that point, Sometimes, you know, there's still ways that you can influence overall um, because on the lead up to an election, people try to get a lot of things through uh, before uh, campaign season. What, what's the role that you think sort of the consumer communication piece of this sort of changing public opinion about it in terms of influencing policymakers should play? So the consumer groups, from a, my perspective, it's really understanding the issues. What are the issues that are important to you and why? Uh, where does your favorite brand stand on these issues? Um, and then is it a discussion? Is it a policy discussion? Is it a brand discussion? Uh, are you working with your local legislators? At the end of the day, all policy and politics is local. And it touches you at that really local level. So as a consumer, if you know that the water company in your town um, really favors a strong uh ecosystem for the natural woodlands. That's great for you. It's great for your community. But that conversation is going to be happening with the, the corporation and policy. And so really making sure that you understand where that is, uh, is powerful. If they're not doing quite what you want, right, leveraging policymakers and leveraging the government as third party advocates to push that across, or vice versa. If, you know, a company is really leading the charge in a conversation, then pushing on them to push towards the other way. A consumer has a, actually quite a lot of power, both through their vote, but also through their ability and their buying power. Um, sometimes it can feel very large, but really, once again, similar to how we talked about risk, once you start breaking it down, there is ways to move that conversation forward. And what do you do, you know, speaking of the risk, and so what do you do when there's backlash? What do you do when you start to engage in an issue and you find that, you know, you suddenly engage people on this issue on the other side in a way that you didn't expect to. It's crisis communications 101, which is be prepared. Have When you are preparing that campaign, whether it's a brand campaign or an issue advocacy campaign, CSR campaign, making sure that you have a preparation for if and when it goes south, right? Knowing why you were doing this campaign in the first place, knowing why this statement is happening and really being prepared. Um, all of my friends who are in crisis communications, that's what they're spending their lives doing, right? Is thinking of how how could this possibly uh, take a wrong turn? And then how are we going to handle that? And that's through research, planning, education, and thinking through that long-term cycle overall. So 
you know, I think the, the, the report sort of wraps up with um, kind of some ground rules for businesses for how yes. to engage in policy communication issues. That I think that those provided some useful tips. And I think that that might be also a nice place for us to uh, wrap this up, this conversation up as well. And so your first, your first tip was start with research. We've talked a lot about that. Yeah. But with research, you mean really understanding both the issues and the impact on the business? Issues and the impact of the business for the full life cycle of the business, as well as researching the audience and where are they in terms of understanding the issue? Where are they in terms of how they're going to be or vote on the issue and the brand's perception with that audience as well? So it's understanding both the policy and the audience in a really strong way. And then your second tip was about or your second ground rule was about how you choose what to advocate for making sure that it's a genuine impact on the business, right? So making sure that you are choosing issues and advocating um, for policy or regulation that truly impacts your brand. If you get involved in a policy issue that has nothing to do with your brand is the first way that you're gonna have backlash. Why does this matter to you? Um, sometimes brands think that they have to do a pile on, uh, on a particular issue, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Really making sure that it's core to you uh, and core to your brand. Third, third topic, which is, you know, and, and the third ground rule, which is, you know, a big, which is what we've been talking a lot about, right, is, is how do you, how do you pick those issues that you're going to be able to engage in without going too narrow, without creating negative backlash? Like, what are, what are some key things to keep in mind there as you're trying to, as you're trying to avoid the partisan backlash? Yeah. So one of the big things is avoiding the partisan environment, right? So being really cautious and careful about where you're placing that messaging, um, making sure that it's a nonpartisan environment, because that allows then both sides of an issue to really understand where you're coming from overall. And I got to tell you, there's nothing as that is too narrow of a subject in policy communications. Issue advocacy sometimes is, the, is at its best when you are narrow in your scope. Um, when you're driving down into really particular parts because it demonstrates an understanding of your industry and the policy that is fantastic and also then can also lead to results. Sometimes actually being too broad can hurt you because people then don't know where you're going. Um, but making sure that whatever that issue is, is really making sure that you're on a nonpartisan platform similar to uh, Politico uh, so that all sides are looking at your messaging. And then your last two ground rules are about strategy. Yeah, yeah. Have a long-term strategy. Never wait for the day of the vote or wait for the uh, outcome of an election. Making sure that you have that long-term strategy uh, planned out. One year, two years, six months. A brand that we've been working with for a very long time started a strategy with us about two and a half years ago. Um, and I would say now they're really seeing a a great impact when it comes to the policy side, but it's because they've really been thinking about it for a long time and they've been able to really work in a calculated way uh, to do that. And then have an integrated strategy. So do not just rely on one place to have that message. So many times um, I find, especially potentially in Brussels, is everyone goes, well, I'll just do a ton of social media. That is, that is the wrong way. You have to think about policy communications in three kind of segments. You've got your public affairs team who are really your boots on the ground, who are having meetings, who are having those touch points. You're having your earned and owned communication, giving them additional research and insight and making sure that they're being seen in different parts of the media environment. And you're using paid media advertising, working with political media solutions as air cover, giving you additional touch points with these policymakers and making sure that that integrated strategy is critical. You can never just use one thing or the other, you really have to use a combined approach to ensure that you're getting maximum exposure in the right way. Last question. So we've talked a lot about sort of DNI issues. We've talked about sort of ESG related issues. What are some of the other issues you see floating around out there that are going to be some of the big topics that, br that brands are going to have to engage in in the coming year? You're going to see, I mean, net zero, you're going to be seeing uh, technologies not going away in any uh, time soon with AI and chat GBT uh, rising to the occasion. 
but you're also going to see uh, commercial policy issues. The cost of living is definitely part of that. Uh, in London, just you know, recently we saw ULEZ come back up as a huge issue. So anything that's really uh, touching people's individual lives um, at that local level is going to start becoming a place where you're going to see legislation uh, really becoming more and more um, palpable. And that's really where you should be keeping an eye out and an ear out for legislation changes. Thanks, Molly. This is really interesting. Thanks so much. No for problem. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I will see you uh, next quarter for our next Fireside Chat. Thanks, everyone.